Hey, uh, how's it going, everybody? It's me, Rarar, Diego, that one kid that you know. Um, you're probably not seeing me as much these days as you would if we were in the physical thing and I'm running around the village and stuff, but that also means you get to experience all these other things that people do. How's DEF CON been for you guys, huh? Digital. Is this something you'd like to repeat? Is this something you'd like to do another time? I don't know. Hopefully, if we do decide, decide to do it, it's not going to be under the virus situation, but whatever. Daniel Kim's got some good stuff. I've been uh, chilling in the Discord. We have some people hanging out in the voice over there. If you have questions about Monero or you want to talk about pretty much anything, drop by our Discord uh, in the Monero Village area. We've got a voice chat where uh, at least somebody's usually hanging out um, from the community to answer questions. Okay. I am set to speak now i'm set to speak today uh, i got a little bit of a half hour slot to fill but this time i don't have to fill it with a bunch of filler because it's an actual talk that i'm going to be giving we're going to talk about decentralization in a centralized world apologies to all the people tuning in from europe i'm spelling it with the z which is the american spelling of decentralization and centralized um instead of an s and when I see it with an S, it makes me cringe inside. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on this. Um, decentralization. Uh, when people hear about blockchain, right? Or when a blockchain is kind of, when a blockchain project is talking about their project, they're like, yeah, you know, we have these goals of decentralization. You know, we, we really feel that decentralization is gonna, is gonna make all the difference. And like, we're, that's one of our, the things we're working towards on a technological level. And uh, it, Nobody ever stops to ask and think, why? why what, what, what is the purpose of decentralization? At this point, it's really just kind of this buzzword, right? That they say decentralization, you go, that's good, right? Okay, so if they make that a goal and it's good, then that means that everything's good. But it's not quite that simple. It's not quite that way. Um, if we don't know what decentralization is for, if we don't know why decentralization is a thing, why it's important, um, and if we don't know like the ways to achieve it, then really we're just throwing words on things and nothing gets better. Um, in fact, many things would benefit from not being decentralized. And we're not going to be able to think about this critically and see what things should be decentralized and what things shouldn't be decentralized um, unless we know really what it's for. So this is kind of a rundown of what I'm going to be talking about right now. Uh, we're going to give some definitions about decentralization, um, and we're going to talk about the different forms that it can take place in, because uh, there is more than just one form. Really, when people say the word decentralization, they mean many, many, many different things, because uh, it applies to many areas of a cryptocurrency project. Um, then we're going to explore some trade-offs. So when you when you choose decentralization, it's not all positives. There are negatives that go along with it. And then we're going to look at a practical application um, and see how that can uh, kind of help us as we look at uh, pro cryptocurrency projects in general and evaluate them and try to think about them critically to see if they're doing something good or if they're just kind of wasting resources. Um, and yeah, that's where we're going to go. And then from here, depending on time, I may give some light touching on um, kind of the world as we know it and how, how we're moving into a more decentralized place. Uh, because we pretty much our world is very centralized, as is the uh, name of the talk. So, who am I? Uh, I'm Diego Salazar. I contribute to Monero, and that's pretty much everything you need to know about me. There's my Twitter. You can go to my Twitter. I don't do anything on my Twitter. <laughs> I don't tweet hardly ever. Uh, so, you, yeah, um, I have long curly hair, and some people like that. So, if that's your thing, then, um, then give me a thumbs up in, in chat. Okay, decentralized, decentralization. As stated before, this is basically just a new buzzword, right? We have all of these things that have become buzzwords in the world. Blockchain um, is the name of the game, but it is also a buzzword because as uh, Daniel Kim was alluding to in his talk, when people are like, oh yeah, uh, we're adding blockchain to the automobile industry and you know their stocks just shoot way up. At this point, uh, blockchain is a buzzword. Privacy is also a buzzword, right? You have Bitcoin and all these transparency point coins. They're like, oh yeah, you know, 
we're not a privacy coin, we're not privacy first, but we're adding privacy. Decentralization is another big buzzword, and it's probably one of the top ones. If you look at almost any cryptocurrency project, I can guarantee you that the word decentralization is going to be somewhere in there. These people, this is, they just know that this is desirable, but they don't know why. So let's go ahead and do the definitions. And like all boring people, when I do definitions, we start with a dictionary. So decentralization is defined by Merriam-Webster dictionary as the dispersion or distribution of functions and powers, right? So then also we're gonna define decentralize um, to move the control of an organization or government from a single place to several smaller ones. And this is defined by the Cambridge Dictionary. And um, I would also expand that definition somewhat so it's not just a single place to several smaller ones. It can really be uh, you know, from three to five, from 10 to 20, from any smaller number of uh, places to larger number of smaller ones. And so the word centralize is just the opposite of that, right? We're moving from many places of power or functions and putting them uh, from many different places to less places. Um, in the most extreme case, into one place, right? One person can do it. Um, so we're going to give an example. We're going to talk about, we're, we're going to move into why would we want to decentralize? What is the point of decentralizing? So in this example, we all start a club. Right? We start a really cool club. We all love Twilight series. We all love the Twilight series. Um, I can't think of a single person on this entire planet that has not read the books, watched the movies, wrote fan fiction, um, all these things. Right, Everybody's crazy about the Twilight series. So we start our Twilight series club. Um, and you know, everyone is either on Team Jacob or Team Edward. And we need to vote. We need to vote who is going to be the leaders. You know, is it, uh, we need to vote on who's going to be the leader of our club, who's going to be leading this thing. But everybody is in these two very political parties of Team Edward or Team Jacob. And I am a Team Edward fan, maybe, and you're a Team Jacob fan, maybe. So I, I don't want the Team Jacob people to be in charge because they're going to cover our Twilight Clubhouse in team Jacob stuff. And that would be awful. Uh, I want Edward posters on the wall. So I, I want to make sure that whoever I'm voting for is part of team Edward. Um, so everybody's going to vote, right? Uh, we Let's say we have 20-ish people. Everybody uh, writes their thing on the ballot and we all put it in the box. But here, there, a problem begins to arise. Um, oh, whoop, uh, that jumped a little bit ahead. We have to count these votes. We have to count these votes. And who are we going to put in charge of these votes? In, in theory, this voting is anonymous. We don't know who voted what. But does it really matter what anybody voted? Like, and let me, let me tell you why. If we put one person in charge of counting all of the votes, and this person is a Team Jacob person, as signified by the J here, then they could just like either not really count the votes or count them but not really care and say, oh, Jacob won, this guy from Team Jacob won, and we would all have to trust this person because we didn't count the votes, right? Um, and this is just not something that we want to do. So this is on one end of the extreme where we get one person to do it. On the other end of the extreme, we get everybody to stay. Everybody is staying here to count the votes, but, you know, the kids are getting tired and, you know, it's been a long day for me. I want to get home. I don't want to stay here and count all these votes. The only way to be absolutely sure with zero trust of who won this is if everybody, absolutely everybody stays and everybody takes out each vote, looks at it, passes it around and makes, and everybody's watching everybody else to make sure we're not doing some sneaky substitutions or anything like that. Right? So ev everybody has to stay. Everybody has to look at each vote and keep their own tally. Then we compare our tallies to each other. And if we all come up with the same thing, then there is 100% assurance with zero trust that we have a correct vote. That's the other end of the extreme. But that requires everybody to take their Saturday to stay here. And we don't want to stay here. But um, as we just discussed in this first example, if we have just this one person here, well, they can go ahead and report whatever they want and we would never be the wiser. So what else can we do? Well, we can decentralize. So from this one person, we've now moved to two people. 
right? And in this case, we're hoping, we're hoping that one is Team Edward, one is Team Jacob. So that way we know for sure that, you know, they're not going to collaborate because what if they're both Team Jacob? Then they're like, okay, so we both want Team Jacob to win. So we're going to agree together that uh, we're not going to really care about the actual vote count. This is just what we're going to be reporting. So we have to kind of make sure that we get somebody who's on Team Edward, Edward and somebody else who's on Team Jacob. So that way when they count the votes, if one person tries to lie, the other person is incentivized to say, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. But there are some attacks that can happen here as well. This is not a bulletproof, foolproof kind of thing. Because what if one of two things happen? I've got a couple examples. What if the guy that is known as Team Edward is actually a secret closet Team Jacob guy? Right? He doesn't tell anybody. He's actually changed teams recently, or he's been convinced by a family member, or he's just lying for whatever reason. And he is converted to team Jacob. Now we have two team Jacob people. I mean, it's the same thing that I discussed. They're just going to agree. Okay. It doesn't matter what the vote is. Uh, we're just going to say that the team Jacob guy wins. Alternatively, another scenario is um, the first team Jacob person is quite wealthy or powerful or has a lot of resources and they're able to say, Hey, I will give you money, resources, whatever you want. If you, uh, if you agree with me that it doesn't matter what the vote is we just agree team jacob wins and maybe this person cares more about the resources than about their allegiance to any particular team so they are um they are persuaded well let's try to decentralize even further because we don't want any of those attacks to happen we want to make sure that this is a fair election so we decentralize even further and we say okay we got four people now hopefully two of them team edward two of them team jacob but now we get to some really interesting kind of uh, game theory things that start happening here. Because what if we're able to get one person to our side, either for, through either of the ways that we were talking about before, where we were able to convince them through resources or they were a secret agent all along, whatever the case may be. Now we're kind of this three against one scenario. And these three people can threaten this person. Hey, if you don't keep quiet about this or if you don't do what we say then we're going to tear we're going to burn all your posters you know in real life scenarios it can be things like they can threaten violence they can threaten uh, family resources whatever and now this person is going to have to go along with them because they have the numbers advantage so we've decentralized into a place where in theory it's like okay four people is good but not everybody has to stay and waste their time counting all of the votes but um we have enough people that we can trust that nobody's going to do anything weird. But in this scenario, it's not enough. So we can do this again and again and again and again until we're all the way back to everybody having to stay to count the votes. So I, if, if you're seeing a pattern here, I hope you're seeing a pattern here. And this pattern is that the more we trust people, the more convenient it is for everybody. Because if we only have one person counting those votes, that's a lot of trust placed in that individual. But it's, it's the only person inconvenienced is that one person. It's much more convenient for everybody else. They get to go home and watch television, right? And the less trust we have, the more inconvenient it is for everybody. And this is basically decentralization in a nutshell. This is going to apply everywhere across the board. When we look at blockchain, we are decentralizing a database, right? It's just a database that has uh, ledger uh, information that says this person has this much money and this person has this much money, but we're decentralizing it. So it's now not on just one server where we have to trust the system administrator is not going to do anything bad with that, or maybe they're not malicious, but they're incompetent. And so uh, hackers get in and they mess with the database. No, we give the blockchain, we give this database to whoever wants it. And now because everybody has it, we don't have to trust anybody. So if I'm like, oh, do I have an accurate uh, uh, copy of the blockchain? I can compare it to many of my peers and say, okay, yes, it agrees with all of them. So we're all good. We're all fine. But the it's much more inefficient. It's much more inconvenient because if you want the most trustless option, you have to download the whole blockchain onto your computer. Now you have to take up your hard drive space, your bandwidth, your everything to be absolutely trustless. 
And when we start thinking about the fact that this is always going to be the trade-off, the more we decentralize, the more inefficient it is, the more inconvenient it is, we need to start asking the question, what things need to be trustless? This is the core question. What things need to be trustless? Because those are the things that definitely we can start to decentralize, um, knowing that there is going to be a cost. But not everything does need to be trustless. When we start thinking, okay, <laughs> to give a very stupid example, and sorry to call people out here, there was a coin back in the 2017 boom called Campus Coin. And the idea was that Campus Coin was a cryptocurrency that students would be able to use to pay tuition or their meal plans or all these things, right? So we're trying to make paying our tuition and paying for our meal plans for our students a trustless endeavor. And I don't, I just didn't see or hear the outcry of students that were like, these, these universities are cheating me. I paid the money and they said they never received it. I don't trust them. We need, to, we need to make sure that they're in check. We need to make sure that this is a whole trustless kind of thing. I, I didn't see this, right? This is something that does not need to be trustless. Same with DentaCoin, the, with paying dentists, right? How many people have been defrauded by their dentist? I mean, maybe there's some of you and you might raise your hand and say, I see a need for DentaCoin. <laughs> But uh, I think for the majority of us, we're able to, to pay them and they're like, thank you for your money. Here's your teeth cleaning and we're good. Um, so kind of in this whole blockchain area, it makes sense in some spaces, for example, distributed ledger technology, there is strong motivation for people to try to mess with money information. Why? Because I can become a millionaire or a billionaire overnight. If I have the capability to mess with the money situation, or I can be malicious against somebody else and they have a hundred dollars and now they have zero dollars. There's strong incentive. Money is such a strong incentive. So kind of this ledger based information, there is a lot of reason why we would want to trust people less. So we may be able and willing to decentralize, become more inefficient. So that way we can trust people less, but I mean, if we, we just can't do that for, for everything. Um, but here's, here's the big thing about decentralization in terms of blockchain. It's, as I alluded to earlier, it's not just one thing. When somebody says, we are a decentralized project, which you hear pretty much everywhere, what does this mean? We're going we're gonna to start uh, kind of poking into a couple, many of the ways that a uh, project can be decentralized. One way, who writes the code? Okay, there, so um, all of these wallets, all of this protocol, all this stuff needs to uh, be written by some entity, usually like pretty much always by people, right? Who is actually writing this code? Is it one person? Is it 10 people? Maybe they have 20 CEOs and one engineer that's actually writing the code. Is this decentralized? They have 20 CEOs, so 20 people looking over, making sure the project is okay, or 20 people in high CT positions, CEO, CTO, these kinds of things, right? But they don't know the code well enough to be able to check on this guy or whatever. So functionally, there's one person who is writing this code. And he has no oversight, which means that this person can put back doors inside, they can, you know, they can do whatever they want. Um, and nobody's going to be around to stop them. Who's writing the code? Finances. Who has the money? Who's distributing the money? If there's like one guy or just a very small team of people who is handling the money of a project, then they can choose like th this. It gets a little subtle here and it gets a little uh, not quite so on the nose, but they can hire engineers that maybe they're less than scrupulous or maybe they're hiring engineers that are incompetent or maybe they're hiring engineers that adhere to a certain design philosophy and not to another one so that they don't have to have as much infighting to get the um to get the project to go in the direction that they want it to go rather than another direction uh, th this kind of stuff is important because when we're talking about decentralization trusting less are we just like you know, the development one is the one that's most well known. Who's writing the code? How many eyes are on the code? But the same thing with money. How many eyes are on the money? How many eyes are on the money who's paying to either hire somebody or fire somebody or to get this research done? What if, you know, there's two um, papers, two research papers that are done for two different, totally different directions that we can take a coin in terms of evolving the protocol? 
Well, the person with the finances decides to fund an audit for one of those papers, but not the other. Once that audit is complete, they can say, look, this way has been audited and they said it was good. This other one is unaudited. So I really don't think we should do that. Well, just like that, you have influenced a community because of money decisions. So it's also decentralization also needs to take place kind of on a financial level. If there's only one group or a small group of people that has all of the money, that's something you also need to watch out for. Research. Who's doing the research? Uh, because, you know, just as I alluded to in the audit thing, perhaps a researcher comes across two or three different ways that things can go, you know, evolve from a cryptographic perspective, and they decide to really pour their all into one of them that they think is the best and not put as much effort into the other ones. They're going to have a lot more. Um, decent, do we want, do we trust this researcher? And many times, many times, yes, maybe many, many times we think they're not malicious, right? But we can never be absolutely positively sure. When we're talking about decentralization, where when we're talking about making things trustless, it's not just on the code. It's not just on the money. It's also on the science. Who's doing the science? Um, and practical stuff. Practical stuff. Who's running the day to day? Who you know? Who's running the the community management stuff? All of these are ways. All of these are ways that decentralization needs to be looked at. So when a project says we are a decentralized project, maybe they mean in one way like we have several different engineers or we're open source. Usually what they mean is we're open source, which means there are several eyeballs on the project. But when you start digging deeper, you're like, oh, but we do have a small group of scientists that's pretty impenetrable, um, like as in it's hard for you to do your own research. Uh, and they're the ones that do the majority of the research. Oh, who handles the money? Oh, well, I see we've got this little group that's, uh, that's responsible for that. What kind of oversight do they have? Oh, we just, we make sure they do good stuff. So they start hand-waving a lot of the, centralized areas they start hand waving away a lot of the centralized the ways that they are centralized and they're like and we want you to only focus on the fact that our development is decentralized um here's what i'm not going to take a lot of time to get into but mining centralization decentralization this is something that you know monero tried to do with random x um, asics tend to lead to centralization of mining over a period of time to particular people with that are able to create new ASICs and stuff. And we don't have time to go over in that. Daniel Kim has kind of discussed this in his talk. Uh, so I would give that a look. But basically the goal is to explain to you guys that there are many ways that something is decentralized. And particularly when a project is centralized in many areas, I would even say in most areas, they do their best to divert attention to the areas, very few, that do exist where they are decentralized. And that's usually the protocol level because blockchain by design is pretty much decentralized as long as there's miners and stuff like it's just the way that it is. And they'll point all eyeballs to that and say, see, we're decentralized when really everything else is centralized. So we've gone through the what. What is it? We gave some definitions. We've gone through the where, right? It can be mining. It could be development. We've gone through the why. Why would we want to decentralize? Because we want to reduce trust. Now we need to talk about the how. And so to discuss the how, um, I'm going to say that I start a new project, this new project, savethemarmots.com. It's not a real website. I mean, maybe it is. <laughs> you can go there and check, but it's not something I've created. Uh, but we're going to say I've started a new project, savethemarmots.com. And you come in and you say, okay, I want to judge whether this project is worth my time. I want to judge whether this project is worth, you know, my uh, my attention, my money, whatever the case, whatever whatever this cause is for. I want to make sure that I'm not going to be wasting any of my resources on this. So save the marmots, um, and I say it's very decentralized. It's very decentralized, and so you're like, ooh, decentralized. That sounds good. Okay, so that's a couple points in its favor. Uh, I may I may put some money in there, but we got to ask the big questions. Got to ask the big question. Um, first of all, does this need to be decentralized? This is always, 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 always the first big question that you should ask yourself. When they say, we are revolutionizing the real estate industry, the automobile industry, the trash picking up industry, the dentist industry. We're decentralizing all of these industries. We need to start thinking, critical thinking. Does this need to be decentralized? Is this something that would benefit from a reduction of trust? Is this a, a something where all the parties don't trust each other? Is this something where we would be willing to tolerate the inefficiencies? What are the inefficiencies? They may not be as neat on the surface. So like for blockchain, the inefficiency is 
it requires proof of work, which requires electrical consumption. It requires power to secure the blockchain. It requires the database to be on everybody's computer. That's a lot of space, right? What? So for blockchain, we might know what those are, but if we start looking at decentralizing other industries, we may not know, it may not be readily apparent to us, what are the inefficiencies that are going to come from decentralizing something? We need to start asking the big question, does this need to be decentralized? But there are a few other smaller questions that we can ask, because that, that's, a, that's a big question and it's probably the most important. Um, and maybe they they're able to give you a good reason why they think that this should be decentralized. They'll typically say, there is a good use case for this. <clears throat> Usually it's a bunch of bullshit, but that's what they'll say. There, there's, there's a good use case for this. Um, but there's a bunch of smaller questions that we can use to tease out whether A, this thing needs to be decentralized, and B, whether the project itself is decentralized. For example, who do I talk to to get information? Who do I need to approach? Who do I need to talk to to get any information about this, uh, about this product? If it is largely contained within one website, one person, one department, right? If it's only a small group of people that is able to give you accurate information about this, then that means that for the most part, the information is gonna be coming from a select group that's gonna tell you what you wanna hear. Um, are there dissenting viewpoints? Are those dissenting viewpoints given a platform? Assuming they're not trying to spread misinformation, which I, I really, I feel sorry for everyone in this day and age of social media where there's so much misinformation everywhere. There's so much noise. It's really hard to distinguish between what is signal and what is noise. But that is another talk in and of itself. But are these dissenters who have different ideas that are, in theory, in a perfect world, presented in a respectful manner and they have good points and they address people's points and stuff, are these people given a platform or are they silenced? If they are silenced, then that says that this is a pretty centralized thing because you need a certain amount of power to silence these people. Uh, you know, and if we look at kind of Bitcoin and BTC from the subreddit perspective, there was a group of people that didn't like the Bitcoin subreddit, so they made their own. Uh, they made BTC. And regardless of what you think about these two subreddits, I don't really care what you think about these things. But these voices were not silenced and they couldn't be silenced. Like in one area they were, but they were very easily able to build a following, build a community of people who disagreed with the first one. Um, whereas many people, those things get attacked, those places get shut down. Um, it, it's really bad if you start getting like some cease and desist letters that shows, okay, these people really do own pretty much everything and it's not decentralized at all. Um, question two, what is centralized and why? So this is a bit of a this is a bit of a, a funky thing that I'm going to throw in here. It's probably best. No, let me let me take a step back. Maybe not probably best. Some projects may choose to centralize some things, and it, we need to understand why they do that because maybe yeah, that's the way to go. For example, payments. Maybe it's just easier to get people paid on time in terms of researchers who decide they can devote their time and energy to this or engineers or people who are going to code full time. They say, you know what? We have decided to centralize the way we do our finances so we can pay people on time so they don't leave us. If they can give you a reason for their centralization, now at that point, you can kind of decide for yourself, well, is this kind of worth the trust? Um, maybe, maybe not. But if they, if they're like, oh no, 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 that's all decentralized, and you're like, no, 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 it's clearly not, right? They need to be able to point to parts of their project that are centralized, and honest people, which are hard to come by, will tell you, yeah, we're a decentralized protocol, but this part is centralized, this part is centralized, and this part is semi-centralized, and here are the reasons why. Okay, now at that point, we are armed with information. You can run it through your personal philosophies and worldviews to see if that's something that you're okay with. But it's definitely something that is rarely talked about. It's kind of hand waved away. Well, no, it's not really centralized. It is. And they need to be able to explain why. Um, so talk to your projects, the, anything that you're interested in. Um, and what can I learn from history? There is a huge amount of examples of not just blockchain projects, but open source projects, business projects, everything all over the world where they have failed 
because of centralization and some have failed because of decentralization. There was too many people that you needed to get a, an approval from to make a decision. And so you missed out on an opportunity, right? You couldn't get all 10 CEOs to kind of give a check mark or all 10 powerful board members to give a check mark either because you couldn't reach them or they couldn't reach a decision. So you missed out on a big opportunity and they go under. Right. So decentralization is not always blanket good. Um, sometimes it can keep you from doing things in a quick fashion, um, but it reduces trust. So there's a ton of examples. Please, please, please go look through failed businesses, failed open source projects, failed blockchain projects. Try to find out why did they fail? Oftentimes, one of the underlying issues is that uh, it was either centralized in some way or decentralized in some way that it shouldn't have been. I'm running short on time. So um, conclusion, summary, and closing, decentralization is this big buzzword. It doesn't, uh, we really have to understand what it is, what its goal is, what it's trying to do. Because otherwise, when somebody says, oh, this is decentralized, we're just like, oh, yeah, that's great. Um, when really, it may not necessarily be that way. So yeah, uh, that's my last slide. That's my last second. It's 4.30 my time i'm an hour ahead of las vegas so it's time for me to back on out of here if you have any questions i will be chilling around in the discord um i'm more than happy to talk with you guys about decentralization uh what i think about various projects and what they claim about decentralization blah 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 blah, blah. so that's it for me thanks for coming to my little talk my defcon talk um I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Go check out everything that we have to offer. MoneroVillage.org has the rest of the schedule for the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you.